Okay, now we are going to be looking at um, the critical importance of an AFCFTA um, non-tariff barrier. And we're looking here in the AFCFTA agreement, Trade in Goods Annex 5. Now, we've spoken at length, so I'm not going to be going into um, any detail about that, but just to highlight the fact that the literature um, shows us, the literature supports the view that women in particular are impacted by non-tariff barriers, which tend to be more burdensome for women traders. And NTBs reported on the continent include customs and trade procedures, immigration procedures, transport-related requirements, and roadblocks. And again, um, substantial literature that speaks to the various non-tariff barriers and how um, men and women are impacted by them. But the fact that NTBs are more burdensome for women traders. Now, it, it's really incredibly exciting that um, under the AFCFTA agreement, there has there's an AFCFTA online portal for non-tariff barrier monitoring, reporting, and elimination created under Annex 5 of the protocol and trading goods. And this tackles on the ground barriers that directly impact MSMEs, informal traders, youth, and women business operators that play a critical role in African trade, but are disproportionately impacted um, by NTBs. Of course, there are a number of reasons that include, um, amongst others, limited resources and access to information. Now, very exciting news about the Trade Barriers um, dot Africa platform that operates as an NTB reporting mechanism tool, um, focusing on identifying and implement eliminating NTBs. Now, this um, platform has been developed by the African Union in partnership with the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNTAD, to, to really make continental trade easier and less costly by helping African businesses to report barriers and to support the elimination with the help of governments. Now, I will leave it to you to, to look in detail at the site, um, to look what the responsibilities are of governments in terms of establishing um, various committees. So please familiarize yourself with Annex 5 of the Protocol on Trade in Goods on um, non-tariff barriers. Familiarize yourself with the non-tariff, non ah, the tariff barriers Africa platform. Please um, make sure you know what that entails, what the responsibilities are of governments, what the responsibilities are of um, the AFCFTA Secretariat, and what the responsibilities are for you in terms of popularizing and sensitizing and creating an awareness of this mechanism, because it's really only by, we all have a responsibility to support effective and meaningful AFCFTA implementation. So you know that this mechanism exists and the onus now is on you to make sure you take that message forward to your constituency. You inform them about this um, phenomenal online tool that is going to play an active role in removing obstacles to continental trade. Because if MSMEs can more easily report barriers to trade and get them resolved, um, we really are looking at unlocking the continent's real trade and potential and that of the AFCFTA. And actually, there's been a hashtag trade easier campaign that has just been launched um, in October, and you'll read more about it in your course materials that aims to promote and raise awareness of the Trade Barriers Africa platform amongst African um, MSMEs, while encouraging MSMEs to use this platform to make trading easier on the continent. So again, it's really important that you play your part in um, in sensitization and in advocacy and in creating awareness about this critical mechanism that will facilitate trade. We've spoken about the, um, the various studies that tell us how important it is to implement trade facilitation measures, how important it is to eliminate non-tariff barrier, non barriers. So let us play our part. Um, let us undertake our responsibility in ensuring that the word goes out and um, critical stakeholders make effective use of these um, various tools that have been created. 
So I'm moving on now to trade in goods, and it says six on technical barriers to trade and seven on sanity and cyto sanitary measures. Now, it's important for us to understand um, that compliance with standards and technical regulations is, of course, important for signaling and guaranteeing the quality of products and traded goods because this helps to encourage trade in industrialization through protecting consumers and creating confidence in manufactured and traded goods in enhancing production and trade capacity and competitiveness and facilitating mutually beneficial trade um, and improving the efficiency of production and trade and in contributing to technology upgrading and absorption. Now, the technical um, barriers to trade in Annex 6 and 7 on sanitary and cytosanitary measures really detail the commitments of state parties to facilitate trade through cooperation in trade related to technical barriers to trade and in SPS. And the provisions seek to reduce the burden of diverging norms by promoting cooperation between state parties and standard bodies, encouraging mutual recognition of different standards, um, harmonizing standards, and ensuring equivalence in technical regulations, building programs for cooperation, and establishing mechanisms to enhance transparency. Now, by covering um, mutual recognitions of standards, licensing, and certification of service providers across the continent, technical barriers to trade and SPS measures make it really easier. Um, the, imp the effective implementation of these provisions would make it easier for small scale traders and smallholder farmers to meet export standards and satisfy regulatory requirements. Um, and these provisions can help to address trade obstacles that remain particularly burdensome for female entrepreneurs, producers, and trade and traders, because we know, and we've spoken at length about the fact that women often struggle to comply with trade-related SPS measures because they lack a number of critical skills and or um, face resource constraints. So these provisions are so important to addressing um, trade obstacles that remain particularly burdensome for female entrepreneurs, producers, and traders. Um, now, when you look at this interesting report, I'm not going to look at it in great detail, but I encourage you to um, not limit yourself to the readings in the modules, but also to look at um, the report in more detail. It's a 2019 report by the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, and it's a report on gender responsive um, standards, because there's been a lot of work done on standards, but not particularly on the gender dimension of standards. So this is very important. Um, it's an important publication and I encourage you to look at it closely. And the report acknowledges itself that notwithstanding the developmental impacts of trade-related SPS measures, the extent to which these impacts have really been um, understood in terms of the, the gender dimension have not received much um, attention. And, and really the, this publication, this gender responsive standards report underscores the importance of ensuring that both women and men participate in standard um, setting processes and that these processes are adequately resourced to consider both the basic needs and long-term motives of all genders in the area of standardization. Now, what does this mean in the context of the AFCFTA? Well, in the context of the AFCFTA, it's going to be important to actively consult and promote the participation of women in the harmonization of standards that reflect the priority needs and interests of women. Um, Women-led organizations, of course, play a critical role in defining these technical assistance, training, and SPS-related capacity building needs in line with the AFCFTA agreement for women to be able to comply with um, these SPS measures. And of course, multi-stakeholder dialogues and other engagements that convene policymakers, the AU Commission, um, the African Organization for Standardization, international development partners are important for identifying a holistic and more inclusive approach to the continental harmonization process under the AFCFTA. Um, because that participants is a 
priority now. We're looking at um, what would a continental harmonization process under the AFCFTA entail. But it's important that when we're talking about that, um, that, that the voices of women are not left out in that process. So again, I encourage you to read that report. Um, I also encourage you at the same time to read the recent technical study by ECA on um, identifying priority products and value chains for standards harmonizations in Africa, because we know that trade facilitation measures can support AFCFTA trade opportunities through investments in standards infrastructure and strategically harmonizing standards in sectors with high AFCFTA potential. So this technical study that's been undertaken by ECA is particularly important because it um, looks at value chains that have been identified across the RECs that include agro-processing minerals, and beneficiation, wood products, irons and steel, um, and cotton. And it also looks at the, according to the potential export basket analysis, which products and which subsectors are expected to be priority products for standards harmonization. And those are identified as mineral oils, precious stones, iron and steel, agro processing. And it looks at specific subsectors in the agro processing sector that includes tea, sugar, coffee, um, edible oils such as palm oils. And the study concludes importantly that the harmonization of standards across the continent will be crucial to supporting the realization of trade and industrialization, particularly with the potential of the AFCFTA and should therefore be given significant priority in the implementation of the agreement. So it's it's in, it's really important um, when we're talking about which are these sectors with high AFCFTA potential and about strategically harmonizing standards in these sectors as part of um, a continental harmonization process under the AFCFTA. It's important to know what those value chains are, what those sectors are that offer um, strong potential and, and must be prioritized as part of this process. Now, very quickly, we're going on to simplified trade regimes. Um, we've spoken about that at length in previous module, so I'm going to go very quickly through this just to say that trade facilitation measures through the introduction of a continental simplified trade regime to can address the gender differentiated trade barriers and extend the benefits of the AFCFTA to small scale and informal cross-border traders. And of course, the inclusion particularly of female traders into more formal trading arrangements supports the participation of this particularly vulnerable group in new export opportunities created through the AFCFTA and also contributes to unleashing their significant entrepreneurial potential. So member states are encouraged, strongly encouraged, to fast track the establishment of a continental simplified trade regime as part of the AFCFTA process. Um, very important to familiarize yourself. I've just put them on a slide, but, but for you to go to the AFCFTA agreement and to understand those technical assistance, capacity building and training provisions that are set out in the agreement and the protocols which include, I'm going to go very quickly through them, but you will look at length um, in the at, at these provisions at length in your in the module and of course in the agreement itself. Um, because it's important to understand it, it's up to it, it's up to you to be able to define what the technical assistance capacity building and training needs are to support um, women and men, who may be disproportionately impacted by trade barriers in order to be able to identify and to take advantage of what these new trade and economic opportunities are as part of AFCFTA implementation. So Article 29 of the Protocol on Trade in Goods on Technical Assistance, Capacity Building and Cooperation, Article 27, 2 of the Protocol on Trade in Services and Technical Assistance, Capacity Building and Cooperation, um, Article 7C on the Protocol on Trading Goods on Special and Differential um, Treatment, um, Article 4 
um, Article 4D on Protocol on Trade in Goods, Annex 6, Technical Barriers to Trade, Article 14.1e, Protocol on Trade in Goods, Annex 7, on sanitary and cytosanitary measures. Now, all of these participants talk about um, technical assistance, capacity building, cooperation, and that will require state parties to cooperate on this for building the capacity of public and private stakeholders. So it's, in it, it's incredibly important for you to define what these training needs are. Um, going very quickly now, working our way towards understanding what would comprise, what would um, entail um, the, the, the process of gender responsive policy making in the AFCFTA, what would that entail, um, what will that contain, and juxtaposing it always against the backdrop of COVID. Um, and when we talk about building back better through gender responsive AFCFTA, policy in COVID-19 economic recovery efforts. What are we really talking about? I'm not going to go into detail about um, the, the fact that COVID-19 has caused immeasurable harm, devastating harm that's going to be felt for years, for decades to come, if, if not longer. And, and of course, one of the casualties, the first casualties of the pandemic was the postponement of the start of trade date under the AFCFTA agreement that was initially set for July 1st, 2020, but um, was postponed to the 1st of January, January in light of the pandemic. So of course, this slide um, talks briefly about the looming debt crisis and um, what's that, the, what's ex the expected outcome of that, the fact that the pandemic puts in peril the continent's um, textile and apparel exports, which remain a cru crucial source of employment for women across the continent. Um, we know that women uh, work in labor-intensive manufacturing sectors that are at high risk of increases in um, layoffs and, of course, disrupting the travel and tourism industry, and the fact that the pandemic is going to continue to have a disproportionate impact of women who comprise the majority of workers and employees, albeit in low-skilled, um, lower-paid jobs in many of these sectors. So I'm not going to go into deep um, analysis and, and detail about um, COVID-19, you know better than I do, and, and you're feeling it um, every day, we, we all are. But just to understand and to highlight the fact that COVID-19 will impact the most vulnerable and marginalized populations, among which women are disproportionately represented. It will impact them the hardest. So tailoring policy support that seeks to mitigate the negative socioeconomic -impact, impacts of COVID-19 on women will have to be prioritized. Now, gender responsive policies and complementary measures that improve women's access to skills development, to training, to digital technologies, finance, trade-related information and infrastructure is incredibly important for women to enhance, um, to enhance the capacity of all, but particularly women who are disadvantaged in these areas, for them to be able to leverage the new trade and economic opportunities under um, the AFCFTA and in the wake of the pandemic. Um, so we we know, we, we have learned throughout the course, and I think what the literature has told us and what we, we're just seeing um, very practically is the fact that the extent to which women can take advantage of trade opportunities, including trade in services, um, digital trade and value chains, depends on more than just trade policies. And that's so incredibly important to know because in the context of the AFCFTA, it's never going to be just trade policies. It's going to be complementary measures. And, and that's what um, we hear for. That's what we we all seeking to define. What are these complementary measures that are really going to provide um, the support for, for men and women to be able to effectively leverage these tremendous opportunities that we're talking about um, in the AFCFTA. So, of course, investments in education, health systems, infrastructure can provide women the human capital that they require to benefit from trade, again, because they're disproportionately disadvantaged by, um, by, by, by challenges in education, in health, um, in infrastructure um, that, that we've spoken about 
um, in, in the duration of the course. And the fact that these impact particularly hard on um, female small scale and informal cross-border traders. So again, when we're talking about our, this is, this is an important time as, as difficult and as devastating um, as COVID-19 is, the fact that it coincides with AFCFTA implementation provides this opportunity for us, for opportunity firstly for policymakers, but also for, for other critical stakeholders um, to support policy and other tailored um, measures that to ensure that women can take advantage of these trade opportunities. So the formulation of um, gender responsive policies and complementary measures now really has to be consistent with our national commitments to human rights, to gender equality that our countries have made at the national level, at the regional level, at the global level, and of course, including the African Union Agenda 2063 and um, Agenda 2030 because tailored policy support that addresses gender inequalities and lifts these binding constraints to women's economic empowerment is going to advance inclusive economic recovery and socioeconomic growth across the continent. So we're going to go now very quickly to informing an approach um, onwards and upwards towards our march of defining gender-responsive AFCFTA policies and complementary measures through gender mainstreaming in AFCFTA national strategies. Now, I want to just um, say very quickly again, because we looked at it in detail, but just to um, mention that the three steps for operationalizing gender mainstreaming in national strategies are the application of gender analysis to key elements of AFCFTA national strategies, the design of gender sensitive monitoring and evaluation, um, AFCFTA national strategy framework, and the design of an AFCFTA communication and visibility plan. But it's important to know that the coordination of the gender mainstreaming in a country's AFCFTA national strategy rests primarily with the trade ministry because the national strategy, of course, rests primarily with the trade ministry. But of critical importance is the need to ensure that this process is undertaken in close collaboration with other government ministries, including the Ministry of Gender, gender focal points, and or other officials from ministries, including important line function um, ministries of education, agriculture, labor, and as well as with the RECs. But because participants, this is a living process. And while the responsibility rests primarily with policy makers as part of an AFCFTA national strategy, gender mainstreaming must draw extensively upon the knowledge and experience of a wide range of stakeholders from the private sector, including women's business associations, labor and civil society, and women's organizations. Now, when I have not included it in a slide, but you are going to be looking very closely. I have put together a table that considers and synthesizes the literature findings from module one to three with proposed gender responsive AFC, FTA policies and complementary measures. So this table looks um, at a sector or a subject matter um, for agriculture, for example, and then it will look at the literature findings at a very high level um, and talk about the contribution that women make to the sector in various roles, talk about gender inequalities and the gender gap. Um, and then we, we're looking at when we're talking about integrating a gender dimension in the design of a new generation of agricultural policies and complementary measures, what would this entail? And I've outlined um, a few um, proposals for, for your consideration. So as I said, the table that's not included in the slide, but that you will review in your module does put together the literature findings, um, a sector in, in relation to a sector subject matter with a view to highlighting potentially what uh, gender responsive AFCFTA policies and complementary measures could entail. Okay, and now we've spoken about um, the fact that 
the 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 responsibility for implementation rests primarily with the trade ministry in collaboration with other um with with other key stakeholders and the fact that gender mainstreaming has been implemented and is being implemented in other countries and informed by the relevant information and gender desegregated data findings from this process of gender mainstreaming in AFCFTA national strategies is guiding the wider development of gender responsive policies and complementary measures to advance the equal participation of women in the AFCFTA. And, and that's what the table attempts to do. It attempts to um, highlight what those potentially would guide um, those gender responsive policies and complementary measures. Now, when we look at the AFCFTA national strategy implementation arrangements to support gender responsive AFCFTA policy, I think it's important to understand and to reflect very quickly on who, so we've spoken about who um, at, the, at the high level who coordinates the and, and whose responsibility it is to draft and uh, the AFCFTA national strategy, but when we're talking about actual operationalization and implementation um, and coordination arrangements, how, how does this happen? Um, who takes forward the practical aspect of the initiatives that have been identified as part of gender mainstreaming? Well, there will be an AFCFTA National Implementation Committee that typically includes um, a number of stakeholders, of course, led by policymakers from the Ministry of Trade as, as the key representative. Um, it's usually these national AFCFTA committees are usually co-chaired by, by the Ministry of Trade representative and a representative from the private sector. But other representatives also include policymakers, and we've spoken about those key departments, the private sector, um, trade promotion organization, national chambers of commerce and industry, business council, um, export promotion agencies, national chambers of SMEs, women and youth business association, um, women entrepreneurs, industry, business membership organizations, and of course, civil society, um, labor, women's organizations, women's co-ops, national and regional cross-border associations, and members of the academia. And it, it's incredibly important for, for there to be a number of stakeholders. And why is that so? Because while governments may have the um, overall and ultimate responsibility for the design of um, policies, it's they really need to draw on the knowledge and they really need to draw on the um, critical expertise of a wide range of social um, partners because it's really these social partners and the experience and the expertise and the knowledge and information that they have that can be decisive and, and can make a critical contribution to shaping um, AFCFTA gender policies in general and AFCFTA gender responsive policies in particular. So women's organizations now, of course, we've spoken about the key role that they play um, in supporting the approach to gender mainstreaming in AFCFTA national strategies, particularly in creating awareness um, and promoting sensitization of the AFCFTA online NTB barrier mechanism, um, contributing to an, an under, a better understanding of what are the trade obstacles faced by female traders. Um, they play a critical role in defining what is this gender responsive trade facilitation agenda. Again, um, building on national and regional best practice that must improve the safety and reduce the time and cost involved in trading, particularly for small scale female traders. And very importantly, to define what the capacity building technical assistance and training needs are to support um, women in various roles. And I'm talking particularly, and I'm singling out women's organizations um, in the context of defining a gender, gender responsive policies, because women's organizations have often been neglected in these policy making processes. And we can't be talking about um, 
gender responsive policy in the era of the AFCFTA if we don't make a particular effort and a special effort in targeting women's organizations and ensuring that the voice of women on the ground is reflected in AFCFTA policy making processes. So that brings us to the end of um, this presentation, friends. And I think I just want to reflect very quickly on um, what is your role as part of the key messages. Now, the key messages are elaborated in more detail in your module. Um, but when in developing a country's AFCFTA national strategy in undertaking the process of gender mainstreaming, you're going to have to inevitably implement. And I think it's important to understand and for us to, to keep underscoring the fact that in the context of developing an AFCFTA national strategy, the responsibility, the ultimate responsibility for the development of this strategy does lie with African governments. It lies with policymakers, but it does not lie with policymakers alone. They, they are key to developing it, um, but in terms of ensuring that they rely and utilize the expertise and experience of other stakeholders, that, that is incredibly important um, because it's not the responsibility of government alone to develop this. It needs a holistic, a comprehensive and all-inclusive AFCFTA national strategy, a gender-sensitive AFCFTA national strategy needs to be inclusive and it needs to have the voices of all stakeholders. Um, and that's why I think it's so important to understand the critical role that you all play and, and to understand your role in this process, because not all of you um, as stakeholders are going to be responsible for developing and formulating and implementing national policy. But you do play a critical role in supporting this process and the ultimate goal of supporting the equal participation of women and men in AFCFTA um, implementation. So while the responsibility for the implementation of the AFCFTA agreement lies ultimately with African governments, stakeholders from the private sector, from civil society, um, from labor, and also development partners will play a critical role in supporting equal participation of women and men um, in the AFCFTA implementation. And, and very quickly, um, you know, African governments have a key role to play, of course, in terms of the design and implementation of gender responsive policies and complementary measures and ensuring that these measures um, address pervasive gender gaps and advance um, women's participation in priority economic sectors. Of course, they play a critical role in ensuring that policies are um, empowering to, to women, in particular in, in terms of providing ICT um, technical skills on the job training for, for women to be able to access higher skilled manufacturing and services jobs. Governments and policymakers are also responsible for integrating a gender dimension in the upcoming AFCFT negotiations on trade and services in terms of the design of a gender responsive trade facilitation agenda that improves the safety and reduces the time and costs involved in trading um, in terms of collecting gender statistics and analysis that will inform gender responsive policies. And there are also there are many obligations and responsibilities for governments. But then investors and private sector actors also have a responsibility to play in advocating for and investing in women's employment, entrepreneurship, and in economic empowerment, including through public partner and private partnership scheme, in supporting mentorship networks, information sharing, um, and supporting training on the job training and retraining um, skills development for women in sector specific activities, increasing the access of women owned businesses to corporate supply chains, um, improving access through innovative financing instruments. And of course, civil society plays a critical role. Um, labor and civil society play a critical role 
civil society in particular needs to lead proactive awareness and advocacy campaigns on the AFCFTA to articulate the pri priority needs and concerns of women um, and to help women to, to be able to identify and to be this voice that relays um, the concerns, the priority needs, and the challenges that women experience, and to bring it to the table as part of the AFCFTA national committees and other pro national processes that will be created, and to ensure that these gender-specific challenges and constraints and barriers that are being confronted in relation to trade are addressed in the design of gender responsive policies and complementary measures that we are looking to identify. Um, civil society also plays a critical role and we spoke about it in um, module three in terms of monitoring and evaluating the progress of AFCFTA implementation and to ensure that implementation reflects the needs and priorities of vulnerable groups in general and women in particular. And there's also a need for international development partners to come together and to use the outcomes emanating from gender mainstreaming in national AFCFTA strategies to design targeted program that supports um, equal participation of women and men in the AFCFTA implementation. And of course, um, there's a need to expand here on relevant research for development partners, for our friends from academia, on trade and market intelligence, on sectoral and regional value chain analysis, and on supporting defined and identified capacity building and training, because there are there is a provision in the AFCFTA agreement that talks about undertaking capacity building um, together with development partners. So knowing what these capacity building needs are, identifying where the gender gaps are, what is um, required to address these gaps, relaying that information to international development partners to ensure that you define what those training needs, um, capacity building needs are, and, and, and that it's not defined by um, international development partners, but that you lead, you develop that agenda and you present it to them and, and define what those priority training needs, what the capacity building are, where, where do you need technical assistance? You present it to international development partners and, and ensure that, um, the, the correct action is, is undertaken. You can see um, participants that I come from the South African government. So um, it, it's very important for me to be able to express and understand the need for, for us to be able to identify um, our training needs and, and to be able to ensure that these are addressed by our partners. So with that, um, that brings us to the end of module two. Um, I think that the next step then is your exam. I hope you have enjoyed um, this course as much as I have. I hope you have learned from it um, and ultimately will be able to use the information contained in the modules, in the lectures. You've seen that from time to time, I um, don't stick, stick to the script. Um, I, I hope that's okay. Um, but of course, you have the course modules, you have the PowerPoint presentations, and you have me as a resource. Um, and I'd like to also offer my, my assistance to you. Um, after the course, you have my email address. If there's anything that's not clear, please get in touch. Um, this is an exciting time, as I said in our introduction. It's the first we get to define um, our country strategy, we get to, to, to relay, to, to bring forward the needs of vulnerable groups, of women, of men, and to really ensure that our country strategy and this historic initiative that has, that some of us grew up with, that we studied, that um, we, we spoke about, that we learned about, and, and we finally have a chance to, to mold, to shape the implementation of Africa's historic initiative. So it is a very special opportunity that we've been given. Um, we all have a particularly unique responsibility. Not all of us are going to um, devise and design and implement policy, 
but we can certainly contribute to it. And we can certainly ensure that um, our governments are made aware of our responsibilities in this regard. And, and I can say certainly um, working with the UN Economic Commission for Africa, um, that we will be creating these opportunities as part of AFCFTA national policy processes to bring policies around, uh, policymakers around the table, to bring um, different stakeholder groups, and for you to be able to hear directly from each other about what needs to be taken into consideration to make um, AFCFTA implementation in the era of COVID-19 um, business unusual because as I said, we've had, we've had experiences at the RICS level um, that we can learn from, that we can scale up, but it has to be business unusual. And I leave you with the following question. What is your role in ensuring that AFCFTA implementation, effective and meaningful AFCFTA implementation is business unusual? Thank you, friends, and we meet again in the exam. Goodbye.